So in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover a few of the essentials of Photoshop so that if you do have Photoshop or have access to Photoshop, you might be able to leverage some of its niceties um, and incorporate it in your designs when you're considering about making your mobile app a, lot, a little more aesthetically pleasing. And as a starting point, we're actually going to be using the iPhone GUI PSD, which someone, uh, I've forgotten his name, uh, Jeff, apparently, uh, has posted. Um, and what's nice about this particular tool set is that it contains pretty much, to, down to the very, very minute pixel level, um, most of the uh, interactions that you might want uh, to render using Photoshop. So never mind if this is your first in, first time working with Photoshop, that's perfectly fine. I'm not going to assume that you know uh, all the nitty-gritty details or anything about Photoshop. We'll try to take it as easy and simply as possible. I did consider using GIMP as a as and doing a demo there, but my knowledge and competency with GIMP would not be particularly useful uh, because I would likely be, be floundering or making mistakes and the interactions are not very one-to-one -one with Photoshop. But uh, certainly some of the tools that you learn here um, hopefully will be able to translate in some sense or form. Uh, although I do encourage uh, for those of you who are interested in design to consider investing in Photoshop and or Illustrator. Um, so the version of Photoshop we'll be doing using is CS4, which is actually one version less uh, earlier than the one that is currently out, which is CS5. If you're a student at Stanford, you can get uh, Photoshop CS4, I believe, and 5 at a heavily discounted rate. So what I'm going to, what I have here right now is uh, I've opened that file up. Um, all of Photoshop files are in uh, PSD format. Um, and what's uh, nice about PSD and, and retaining files within that format is that you get a bunch of really cool things uh, bundled with it. It's sort of saving, like saving your workspace. You may be familiar with the JPEG and GIF formats for, or GIF or GIF formats for images. Basically, those are sort of what are termed flattened versions of uh, images that you can play around with in Photoshop, for example. So think of it as a stripped down version of PSDs, where PSDs you can really retain all of the work that you do um, in, in its myriad forms. And we'll, we'll discover that a little more in detail. So this is pretty much your, your playground, if you will. There's a variety of things that you can do, but the main things to remember is that you have a toolbar. If you're doing this with the uh, Windows version, it's always going to be f similar as well. This toolbar is going to contain pretty much everything you'll ever need. Um, and I believe you can move it around um, as you see fit. Uh, having a hard time moving around. Um, but you should be able to Maybe in the Mac version it docks it, but you should be able to move it, uh, you know, manipulate it as you as as you like. So all of the pretty much everything we need uh, at our fingertips are here. There's a variety of things that will also happen at the top menu bar. Uh, there's obviously also the the menus which pretty much uh, cover everything, but are a little less discoverable. And to your right, you'll have uh, palettes or sort of, uh, you know, is sort of subsets of data. And right now it may seem like there's a lot going on right now, but we'll pretty much focus pr on these things right here as well as subsets of here for now. And um, I'm actually going to uh, take a step back and open a new file or create a new file. You can do file new or command new. Or Control N in your uh, in your on um, Windows, and you should see a dialog like this. And basically, what it gives you is the ability to define uh, define your workspace. Typically, you want uh, to define things in terms of pixels because it's a really easy metric. You don't have to pull out a ruler necessarily, and the definition of inches is really predicated on your resolution. Right, so the resolution factor here defines how many pixels you consider to be in an inch. 
the higher pixel number resolution number you have the larger the file will be but also the more detail that you can encapsulate so sometimes when you see um, while these aren't exactly the same one-for-one -one, uh, representations you might see that certain uh, when you certain photo use like photo services they'll ask you to have digital forms in terms of 30 300 dots per inch it's basically the same uh, premise I'm not sure if it maps one to one. The rest is pretty much you want to define your workspace. Now on you, on your on your browser things may on your machine things may be different. Some of you may have a 1200 pixel wide by, by 900. Um, so you want to make sure that you uh, you know whatever you're designing you want to define a width, but you're not sort of uh, set uh, or fixed. You don't have to set yourself in stone if you put in values here. You can always change it. So let's try something. Just let's make a squarish uh, uh, file. So 400 and 400. And I'm assuming that this is not going to be particularly big. Things will be big if you st if you use a higher resolution because Photoshop will, uh, will set the zoom in such a way that um, the full extent of the workspace is being used relative to the number of pixels you use. So I usually keep it at 72. Uh, the other thing that you want to consider is the background content. And um, for the most part, you can keep it white, but the other very convenient thing to, to use is transparent, and we'll go over that uh, later. Um, you once again nothing is set in stone so let's just go ahead and press OK and now you have a blank slate um, if you'd like to confirm or change any of the parameters we just set you can use image size um, now this is slightly different to so this has all the, the sort of dimensions that you've set previously but it's different from canvas canvas size which is the second parameter down the canvas size changes uh, the the amount of space that you have um, to play around with, right? So if I were to change this to 500, it would create additional space uh, to work with. And to make that point a little clear, let's actually undo and go back to our initial state. I'm going to fill it with color, and we'll see what happens when you change the canvas state. The way you can undo uh, is a little. Um, it can be a little complicated. You can do Command Shift Z. I think uh, I always forget. Ah, Command Z. Actually, sorry. Um, and for, Windows has a little bit different thing, so Command Z will work, but it won't work for multiple levels. You, you know, in your in. So if I were to do um, do certain several steps, you wouldn't be able to do Command Z all the way. Uh, so that's where you'll actually have to use Command Shift Z. Um, but let's make sure that I'm not making things. Uh, too uh, obtuse. Let's take a look at history. So if you go under window, you should be able to see history. And the only thing that we have right there is the fact that we created a new uh, thing, right? And if we were to go to forward, um, no, actually, if we were to mix, if we were to do something, so this paint bucket tool is actually going to be the first thing you'll be familiar, you'll get familiar with. with um, and once again, I really encourage, like, there's only so much you can learn uh, in a video tutorial. So we'll use the paint bucket tool. If we were to paint something right now or fill the area right now, we wouldn't see any change in color, specifically because the foreground color that we set is, is white. And white on white doesn't show anything. So if you click on the topmost square right here, you'll actually see that you can choose whatever colors you want. Um, what's nice here is that you can change the particular uh, color set that you'd like, and you can um, and you can you know select within that space. There's not much of a need to actually explore only web colors. This was when you were considering web safe colors back in the day. Uh, certain colors would be rendered more true than others. Uh, for the purposes of this, we're actually going to not really care about that, and let's choose a random color. And if we fill the space right now, we see that there is blue all over the place. If we were to hit Command Z, it would undo. Awesome. Now, if we were to change canvas size uh, to bring it to 600, for example, wide, what happens is that you have more space to work with, 
which is sort of expected. It's as if you just changed your canvas uh, size. Uh, and let me actually undo and, and notice that when you do Command Z, it actually does only one step. Um, you can undo more than than you'd like uh, by doing this one, which I always get confused. Is I think Command Shift Command Z. Um, but if you were to change the image size, what happens is that it assumes that everything that you'd like here is a particular image, and what it'll do is it'll shrink or expand the existing space you have. So this little linkage right here uh, makes it so that whatever proportions that you have in terms of ratio between width and height are maintained. So if you were to do 300 by 300, it would just become smaller, right? But that basically means that everything that was on the upper left corner and the bottom right corner always gets maintained, right? But if you were to do this with canvas size, you would actually be cutting off um, the area. So uh, let's actually demonstrate that by using another thing called the Rectangular Marquee Tool. This basically lets you select things uh, using a particular shape. So let's try it. Um, we can do a circle. You can do a square, obviously. And what you can do is you can select areas. All right. If you press the Shift key, actually, what's nice is that it'll actually select it so that the width and height are, are constrained such that you'll always get a circle. All right. So now what we'll do is we'll let go of the mouse and we'll uh, select um, a different color. And I'm going to just be adventurous and choose brown. And go back to our paint bucket tool and select the area within. If we're to select the area outside, obviously, um, actually nothing would happen, actually. Um, that's because you actually have to force the selection tool to actually recognize that you were selecting the other area, which you can do by hitting Control. Once you hit Control, uh, actually, I'm sorry, could eat. Uh, oh, mm, I, wonder why, ah, mm, I wonder why that's not working. Um, I seem to have been ah, st um, sorry. So the one of the issues here that's easy to fall into, uh, one of the problems you can fall fall into is that based on the selection tool that you use, the parameters that are available when you control hit control are uh, different. So what I had right there was I had a paint bucket. So when you hit control, it's going to try to do give you options that you can do specifically with the paint bucket tool. Whereas we actually wanted to select the opposite area. We wanted to select everything outside, which you do by hitting the the same selection tool and hitting uh, the control key and clicking. And now you see that there's different selections you have. And the second right there, position right there, will say select inverse, in which case we have now selected everything but what we have selected right there. So let's go ahead and fill that with a certain color. Cool. And so what I'd like to sh show you back again, going back to the canvas idea, is that if we were to do image size and resize this, everything will become smaller, including the circle. But if you were to change the canvas size back down to 300, what it'll do is it'll cut off everything that is not out, not within the bounds of that 300 space. So this is all nice and good, but it doesn't necessarily harness. Um, there's a bunch of other cool things that you can do. Uh, you can obviously step back in history, uh, depending on the amount of memory that you have. You'll um, at some point you'll have a limit to the amount of things you can go back to. Um, but what's nice is you can step through your history that way. Once again, if you've lost that, just go to Window and click on History. Um, I think one of the key aspects of uh, Photoshop um, is the ability to use layers. And this was introduced fairly early on in Photoshop, but once it came into the field, everyone could basically not live without it. And in some of instances of the de default view, it might be hidden. So hit if you don't have it, um, click on layers if you have it on the right hand side. Um, if you don't see it, um, just make sure that you can hit F7 or hit layers. And what will, what will happen is that you'll see just one background element right here. And that basically says this is all the canvas uh, that ha all, all that the canvas has. Let's select everything. So you can do you can select everything like that or 
hit com command all and if you delete everything the thumbnail right here reflects what you just deleted all right so let's go back now that's nice but what what are layers basically and the layers essentially let you um, stack things on top of each other so if you had photos on a coffee table for example you could rearrange them one on top of the other so let's actually create a new layer by doing file image ah, layer sorry layer new layer and there's a bunch of, there's two things that are kind of crucial here um, layer and layer from background and we'll, we'll investigate the first one first basically what it does you can name it something usually I don't name it unless it has some sort of semantic value what it does is it creates a transparent sort of holding area on top of the image that you on top of what you had as the background so in order to demonstrate that let's take advantage of another tool called the rounded rectangular tool and sort of try to explore what Photoshop can do while exploring the idea of layers so click on rounded explore uh, rectangle tool you might actually have rectangle tool selected so if you click and select on that you should be able to and hold on that you should be able to see the variety of selections you have and rounded rectangle tool ends up being one of the cooler tools that I had the hardest time trying to get to because no one would tell me how so once you do that what you have is a variety of selections that come up here and these are pretty key because they'll define what will happen once you have created basically a selection area that has uh, a bunch of rounded edges and so in order to do that um, just keep keep an eye on the three buttons that you have on the top left corner which are sort of separated by the marker right here the middle one is what you want and if you hold on if you hover over it you'll see that it says path shape layers will actually fill in the color uh, so it, it, it may be a little let, let me demonstrate so let's do the first button it might be the default selected in your instance and let's choose a particular color and what I'll do is it will actually create and you can drag and select your area and it'll actually fill that area with a particular color which is nice but usually the kinds of instances you uh, things you want to be able to do is not just necessarily fill in an area but to be able to manipulate that area, change its color, use it as a selection area, right? So one of the things while we're at this that you'll notice is that it created what is a, a essentially a new layer, and uh, what it what happens is that this particular um, uh, black box right here now is totally independent from what has been underneath it. And in order to make that sort of a little more concrete, let's go to the Select and Move tool, basically the first one. Um, and notice that you can actually hit, select each button uh, just by hitting the character on your keyboard that corresponds to what is told at the end. So if you wanted the Wand tool, just hit W. If you want the Move tool, use V. And if I were to move this around, I can move it without having it sort of stuck to any layer. For the bottom one, the blue one, we can't, even if we go back to that layer in the selection, you have to select your layer by clicking on it. Even if I click on the blue thing, basically you, I can't sort of dislodge the blue b bit uh, from it. And so any change I make has to modify that blue layer explicitly. Whereas in this one, I can hide it just by clicking on the visibility icon right here or make it visible like that. So layers are definitely your best friend. Um, and so let's go back to this idea of creating a rectangular square, but let's make it using uh, another alternative. Instead of making it the path, uh, the shape layer, we're going to actually make it a path. So um, let's actually create another new layer and layers are really easy to discard so if you don't like this black square you can either uh, delete it using the delete key or you can drag it to the little dustbin at the lower right corner so let's go back to that rectangular uh, thing the rounded rectangular too it's you and let's select the, be the, the middle one the path and what path does is it makes it so that you can actually create like a non-committal shape Right, so let's say, okay, that's fine. That's exactly the sort of square I want. What you can now do is you can actually hit Control, and what you, what you can do is you can then now make 
a bunch of things. You can fill the path, so you can fill it like you did just before. We can fill everything within it with a certain color. You can stroke it, which basically means uh, not sort of like stroking your cat, but more like following along the path and filling it with a particular thing. So let's just demonstrate that. Um, what you can do is you can select a variety of things to stroke or fill the, the edge of the layer with. So let's use brush. And since I had a wacky brush, it actually filled things kind of completely awkwardly. Um, but in your case, uh, and if I should actually reset my brushes, um, so let me do that really quickly. Notice I had a bunch of brushes that are uh, sort of not supposed to be there. Brushes and pencils are basically going to be your freehand drawing tools. And I would assume that in your scenario right here, you have something when you click on this particular tool, you should have the little brush icon and some small, pretty small value right here. I had something different from a previous project, so that's why everything went kind of haywire. But let's actually go back and go back to our uh, um, uh, rectangular thing tool and let's select that particular thing and do the stroke path again. And you should see that basically what happened was that you have a, you have a line going through uh, following along the path. Now that white might be disconcerting, but basically it's just a property of the uh, particular uh, path tool, and when you hit any other, um, let me just see, um, hmm, I actually don't know why it's not disappearing, but the better approach to it that I can sort of quickly back down to is the fact that instead of doing a stroke path or anything at that particular instance, what you can do is actually use the second tool, which is the more uh, appropriate one. So let's go back to our re rounded rectangular tool and do uh, make selection and basically what it does if you leave all the defaults right here what it does is it makes exactly a sort of a type of selection um, from that particular path which is really convenient in multiple ways now if you're in this the exact same setup as myself you could you should actually see that your bottom layer is selected right so what would happen if I were to drag and move around this selection Thing using the move tool. It would actually pull apart stuff from the layer and you can actually see it. And that's because I selected the bottom layer and I'm making a manipulation on that. Which is not what you'd like. You want to be able to create something that you can manipulate. So what you want to do is be able to select that from a, multi from a uh, different layer. So let's hit our second layer. If you haven't created one, feel free to create a new layer just right here. And what you can now do is you can fill that particular sec selection with whatever color you'd like. Right? It's exactly like a select tool, but we've kind of made taken advantage of the fact that the selection process gives us a nice rounded and cur curly edge, and um, that's that's you know a neat feature to have. While we're on this curly edge thing. Uh, the reason I'm going down this path is that it may be useful for your designs for buttons. Now you probably wouldn't want to have a button this big, but let's take a look at something first before we do any manipulation uh, yet. Actually, since the background is a little little uh, um, confusing for me now, I'm actually going to hide the back and just keep what I have um, right here. Now the gray and white here defines the fact that it's transparent and if you were to use it in, and export it into an image it would not be visible, it would be transparent. Now the transparency actually is contingent on a couple things including your file format and we'll export, explore that later when we export the file. Let's say, let's try another cool feature that I really like about Photoshop and that's basically gradients. What you can do is you can change the color gradient from one edge to another or from one corner to another or as you like a freehand by selecting two colors that you'd like to blend together. And so to make that point a little more clear, let's set a background color. Let's set it to a color that's a little bit off cue from the color that we first selected. So you can always sort of eyeball something that's a little different. And what you'll do is you'll make it so that one color starts here and another color ends here. And in order to do that, hit the paint bucket tool and hold. And you'll see that there's a tool called the gradient tool. The gradient tool essentially makes it so that you can actually 
create a smooth mm. gradient from one to another. So you'll actually see that my previous work has done something from blue, light blue to dark blue. If you hit this particular spot right here, you'll actually see that the first preset corresponds to the color that you just selected from foreground to background. And if that doesn't sort of uh, that doesn't look too clear, let's actually choose another more gla glaringly different color like yellow. And if I hit this particular tool right now, you'll notice that it starts from brown and ends at yellow. So let's select that. What I'll do is it fill, fill up your um, selection area right here with that particular color. If you'd like to make more uh, minute changes, you can always do that. Um, and let's hit OK. And now we can actually, once we hover over our selection area, instead of filling that area, we can actually hit shift, or not shift, we can just use click and hold. And what click and hold will do is it'll set a starting point, which is which I called here, and an ending point, which is a point where, where you let go of your mouse. And what it'll do is it'll fill the color in, uh, in accordance with that particular um, gradient that you set. Right now, it looks a little garishly different from what we what we selected. So let me make sure that actually it's doing what I expect it to. Mm. Hmm. It seems to be filling things. Uh, mm -hmm. Ah, I had some presets set beforehand. Sorry. If you see mode right here, it should actually say normal. In your instance, I've been playing around with things a little. Uh, with with my Photoshop instance and rather than reset everything I've kind of assumed that everything was okay but I've been doing some wacky things apparently. So if you do uh, do exactly what I said you should actually see that um, the colors should appear something like this. If you hit the shift key, remember in the previous one we had a circle and we hit the shift key it constrained things. The shift key generally does do constraining for you. So in this case constrain will be something in one direction only. If you hit shift key while you click and drag, it'll actually do things in one direction even if you were to move things. It'll do things in 45 degree angles as well. The general idea is that you'd like things to be as straight as possible and Photoshop gives you that convenience. So let's uh, let's make this a little more elegant. And there you have uh, a pretty big button, but it's not exactly what we'd like. So let's go back to our marquee tool. Once we, once we uh, make remove our selection, it's really hard to actually get back the original selection. You can do that, but you actually have to use what's known as a magic wand tool, which will try to guess what your selection is most ideally going to be. So if you hit this in the middle, it'll actually select the band of colors that are most likely to be the similar color. It's going to assume what you want to select, but we're actually going to tell it that we actually want to reselect the entire area right because we perhaps we want to do some manipulation so the smartest thing to do here is to actually select the outside area and deselect from that so if you remember the the option to do that was using con the control key and we will do um, select inverse in which case now we have selected all the area that contains color which is nice because now that we we have that we can actually move it th move things around using the move tool we can select everything and move it which is nice Let's say we wanted to make this a little smaller. There's a really cool tool called the Free Transform tool, which will basically let you transform the size of a particular item um, using really nice uh, handlers that appear uh, pretty much around your um, around your your object. So let's hit the Free Transform form. You can do Command T or Edit. Go under the Edit window and hit Free Transform. And what it'll do is it'll actually create a sort of box around whatever object you have, be it a circle, square, or whatever shape or image, and it'll let you actually manipulate the size. Um, if once again, if you hit Shift, it'll actually constrain the proportions so that they're actually uh, um, maintaining the proportions. You can also alternatively change the the the, per the percentage of scaling uh, to a more numeric value if you like numeric. Here, notice that it's actually not constraining uh, the 50% um, uh, at, at the same thing at the same time. So what you can do is hit the little uh, lock uh, sort of chain here, and once you do 50%, it will maintain both width and height at 50% of the original size. 
You can also do some cool things with angle. If you're nitpicky about numbers, you can actually put those numbers right here. Or what you can do is actually uh, move things around whenever you see the little curvy thing uh, that appears on your cursor. The curvy thing is actually separate from the square, the straight line things that you see at the corners. And these generally appear only when you have your mouse hovered over the squares. All other instances will actually do a rotation. So if you click and drag, it'll actually rotate um, uh, things uh, in, in any direction that you'd like. If you click and hold this, it'll actually change uh, the, the, uh, the, the overall size, and you can do things in any dimension as well. But if we'd like to make a, a button that actually looks like a button size on a, a mobile device, for example, we can actually, um, we, we should probably leave things as they were initially. So I'm going to hit escape and do the exact same transformation by command T. And uh, I'm going to make it a little smaller and reduce the size right here. That looks more like a, uh, a size for a button. And once you hit the move tool or do any other uh, tool, um, so let me go back that and that might have been a little quick. Um, if you do um, if you do your transformation and you're pretty comfortable with what you'd like, what you'd like to what you do is generally select another tool in which case it'll, it'll say it will confirm and ask you do you want to apply this particular transformation and uh, if you hit cancel it bring you back if you don't apply it will uh, return you back to the original and if you apply it sets it in place. So we can move around that. Cool. Uh, so that's one aspect. Let's add, add a bit of text to it. Um, and so uh, the text tool right here is the T, uh, the horizontal type tool, or uh, pit, uh, put T. The options that come up as a result of selecting that are available here. Uh, your fonts that are available in your system should correspond something to like this. I strongly, strongly encourage you to uh, explore the variety of fonts that are available out there because it's a really fun thing to do uh, if you're in a de in, into design. And there's always a variety of sources that really have a nice selection of fresh fonts that you can use. The ones I can recommend include dafont.com, D-A font. Uh, it has a really nice selection of fonts that you can, you can uh, download for free. All of these are free and licensed. Uh, not, they're non-licensed, although some of them uh, will uh, have some sort of minor details about GPL and the like. You really don't have to consider yourself uh, unless you're doing something uh, uh, commercially. Um, and so you can, you know, select any of the fonts. You can download them. Most of them work for both Mac and. Congratulations! Um, you won. Oh, great! Wonderful. Um, you can, you know, you can see what select what fonts are available. The uh, side twist to fonts is that there are things called dingbats, which can be really convenient when you're trying to do images or sort of, um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, clip art type things that have um, a bit of uh, art artisticness to it. And these are fonts. Uh, these are not image clip arts necessarily. So you can actually take advantage of the full spectrum of fonts that is you can resize them, that you, you can fill them with color, you can put gradients on them, you can do all sorts of neat things while using them as fonts. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead, I think I have Fantastic Creatures, this is one of my favorite ones, but let's go ahead and download that. And on your system, be it a Windows or a, a Mac system, you should be able to um, double click it um, and uh, install it. Uh, on a Windows you may actually have to uh, uh, right click and your fonts should be there. What's nice about Photoshop is that it will pick up those fonts automatically. So if you close that and click here you should be able to type in fantastic creatures and it's there. But for now let's not get too distracted and actually take advantage of a font. So choose a particular font. I happen to like Lobster, it's one of those fonts du jour that's uh, pretty much pretty uh, rampant everywhere. And once I start typing, you'll be able to see why. So let's put text. Um, depending on whatever system you have, you might have a you know this sort of wavy thing going on right here. If you want to get rid of that, just hit the rectangular marquee tool and click anywhere, 
and it'll disappear. Let's go, go to our text tool and select wherever you want to type. Now, when you're typing paragraph, you can actually drag the selection area. And the reason why you want to do that is that it will try to automatically format things such that they fill up the space as much as possible. If you're doing freeform text, you actually don't have to do that. And you can just click uh, and uh, you can even move the selection area really conveniently. Once again, all the functions that you need are right here in terms of modifying that font. You can make it smaller. It's hard to see what smaller is relative to certain things, so let's start typing. I'm going to create this button called Press This. Now, in my case, since I have done some things previously, uh, the, the text is actually starting uh, from the right edge and going leftwards. That's because I've set it that way right here. Let's actually change that such that it's left aligned. And all of the fonts now are constrained to a particular, it's, it, the color is a little bit illegible. It's because it uses your foreground color by default. And if you were to go ahead and change that color right now, nothing would change because I would actually have to select all of the fonts colors as they are right now and change that to, say for example, white. The reason behind that is that you could change your color uh, as you go and, and make things like something like that, right? And um, so if you wanted to do that, let me just select that and uh, change it to a little bit of a mm, lighter orange, orangey color, something like that. Not particularly aesthetically pleasing, but let's go ahead and select all and change the font size as you, as you see fit. And uh, when you want to move it, just uh, hit uh, cl click and hold. Um, it will edit the text if you see the cursor bar, but it will move it when you see the move cursor. So it's pretty much self-intuitive, uh, pretty much intuitive that way. Cool. Um, so once you're happy with that, let's always go back to the move tool, which sort of sets things in motion right there. If you'd like to re-edit this text, notice it's another layer, so you, it nothing is sort of set in stone. You can um, hide it as well, uh, which is really convenient, obviously. But if you hit the type tool, and click on the area again, you should actually see the cursor bar and you can modify that text accordingly. So I'm going to change that to something like that and set it instead. Cool. Um, so I don't want to make this too long. There are a variety of things that we can uh, explore and I will try to do that in a separate one where we'll uh, actually go about doing image manipulation. This one's a little more concentrated on fo image, cre uh, you know, creating uh, images. So let's actually go ahead and save this. Now the one thing you'll notice is that we have a lot of white space, a lot of transparent space right here, right? And um, it may be convenient to have that, but if we were to save and export this, this image file would be really large and the button space would only be in the middle. And so whenever someone would click, they would click potentially some white space that they assume and it would actually trigger this image. So let's Let's resize our space uh, so that it only captures the part that we care about. If we want to be a little more nitpicky about font, uh, about precision, uh, you can change the zoom right here. And I'm going to do that just to demonstrate. So if you hit 200%, it actually zooms the area a little bit more. Uh, you should be able to do that as well with the zoom tool if you're in the move uh, tool selection. Let's use the crop tool, which is uh, the other thing that you'll be using quite often. If you hit C or use a crop tool, you'll see this little uh, two uh, right angles uh, collapse together. And what you can do is you can click and drag and select the area that you'd like uh, to crop. And what it does is it makes sure that uh, you can confirm that everything that is in the gray isn't going to be removed. Everything that is that you can see in its true natural form is going to be retained. If you want to make sure that um, if you've gotten things a little bit out of uh, out of sync, you can actually change that kind of in the same format as um, the uh, the tra free transform tool. It'll try to do some intelligence uh, intelligent uh, rearrangement, and if that becomes a little bit annoying, you can always use your keyboard arrows. Once you're ready, you can hit enter or use the move tool, uh, you know, as a default. Let's hit enter, and now all our canvas is now um, cons uh, cons the canvas consists uniquely of that uh, space. And if you don't know what that space is, you can either go to image size or canvas size and I'll tell you that it's 181 by 63 pixels, which is generally going to be a, a pretty decent space. Cool.
So once we want it, we're done, we're, we're happy with what we want, we can save it as a JPEG or GIF file. And so uh, let's go ahead and do save for web, web and devices. What's nice about this is it'll actually try to optimize or give you a variety of optimizing parameters that you could use. The original, you can make your comparisons between the different optimizations uh, using the, the tabs on the top. Generally, what's more of interest is what happens on the right-hand side, in which case you're, def you're going to define things in terms of a GIF or JPEG. And the difference between the two is the graphic interchange format lets you actually take advantage of transparency. So whereas JPEG will actually transform all the transparent part that we had in our image to white, GIF will actually keep that transparency so that your edges look um, a little, uh, smooth, you know, your image can be applied to any background and that background will peek through. Uh, so your, it's up to you what you want to do. If you choose JPEG, uh, your default quality should be about 60. If you don't know what's the, the amount of quality effects, you can actually hit, uh, you can actually sort of drag this little toolbar by hitting the drop up and down arrows, and you can actually see if you look very carefully that once your quality goes down to zero, you, you get to you get sort of these optimizations that really destroys the quality of your image. But if you're trying to make things as small as possible, notice that this is 1.395 kilobytes. If you bring that to 100, uh, it's almost 10 times as much the space. But in this day and age, particularly um, with uh, dial-up not being that big of a concern, although there's actually quite a few, uh, quite a big population of the, Amer the US apparently that still does dial-up, and obviously the rest of the world to consider, uh, 10K is very small. Once you start having 100 of these images, you might want to consider optimizing a little bit. And 60 is a good compromise. Sometimes what they set it at is because people really can't tell the difference between 60 and 100. But if you are into design, you would easily be able to see where someone has made that compromise. And um, the rest is pretty much simple. If you hit save, it'll tell you that you'd like to save it as um, so I'm going to save it on my desktop and call it uh, test.jpg. And in this case, I've said, okay, I don't want to deal with transparency, so I'm going to reduce, make everything that is transparent into white. So that should pretty much cover um, the bulk of this tutorial. Uh, in the next video, I'm actually going to go about uh, ex um, exploring image manipulation. Um, and how you would uh, take advantage of Photoshop specifically for photos and images because that's what it's truly for. Um, and uh, also before I finish I would strongly encourage you to play around with this PSD file because it has a variety of things that, that you can take advantage of. Um, so to quickly recap, let's say um, it, all of these things are actually binned into folders and so just like you'd have layers if you play around with making some things visible or invisible um, so since that was a little hard to see if we actually go to the iPhone uh, portrait view and we start uh, removing things you'll actually see that certain things correspond to certain layers and um, you can play around with them you can modify them move them around change the colors and use it uh, use some of the tools that we covered in this uh, video uh, to uh, to manipulate and make mock-ups or your final uh, buttons for the uh, for the class.